A man who just got a massive win over Arkansas. Didn't cover, though. Yikes. Only one by three, not 20. So, was it, was it an actual win? You tell me. I don't know. And this weekend has the third Saturday in October, a massive game against Tennessee at home. Ladies and gentlemen, seven times, Coach Nick Saban. Yeah. How you doing, Coach? I'm great. How are you doing? Only one by three. That's a loss. Uh, how are you doing this week? <laughs> no, I'm joking. Uh, let's talk about that Arkansas game. What did you learn from your team in that win? Got close. Got hairy. What did you learn from the boys down there? Well, we got ahead 24-6 in the game and, you know, sort of lost our collective focus um, in the game. And, you know, I think it's a great lesson for everybody to learn that, you know, when you have the right sort of mental intensity and focus, how well you play. And then when you lose that for whatever reasons, uh, scoreboard, uh, get relieved, relief syndrome, I call it, uh, like we got this, um, you know, how people can take advantage of, you know, that lack of intensity that you play with. So hopefully that's a lesson that our players learned and they learn that they have to play one play at a time for 60 minutes in the game, which everybody's heard that a thousand times, but it's still the truth. Cliches are a cliche for a reason. You know, that's just kind of, uh, they're true. That is why they are cliches. That's why they are said, and you got to hammer it home for everybody. Do you agree with the notion that normally the Alabama teams of the past that have been successful have entered week one playing like dominant football, their best football? This year, it's a little bit of a different story. A lot of growth we're seeing. Even this last week in the second half, kind of getting settled. A lot of growth. Do you feel that? Do you see that with this team, that this is like the most, I don't want to say coaching, but the most growth and development that your teams have had in a long time in one season? I, I think I agree with that. I think this team, being a younger team, um, maybe not the experience and maturity of some of the teams in the past, uh, and especially at leader, what I call leadership positions. And uh, I think that I'm very pleased with the way this team has developed. Now, we still have lots of room to grow, uh, and that's something that we're like embracing the challenge on. You know, I love coaching this team. You know, they've got good relationships, they like each other, they support each other, but there's some competitive maturity like we just talked about, you know, not getting relief syndrome in the game I and being able to play for 60 minutes that we, we still need to learn how to do. Go ahead, AJ. Coach, you say that relief syndrome, which I've never really heard it termed like that. It makes it makes a lot of sense when you say it, but how difficult is it playing with a lead? Obviously, it's a great position to be in. You want to be playing from a lead, but we see it all the time, especially if a team jumps out to an early lead. What do you got to do, I guess, to kind of keep your foot on the gas and not kind of let human nature take over? I think, you know, we talk about this all the time. You know, how are you impacted by external factors? The scoreboard is an external factor in the game. So you get behind in the game, you put your foot on the gas and play harder or better or whatever. Uh, you get ahead in the game, uh, you get relieved and don't play as well. All right? But neither one of those are good things to do. You know, if you're trying to be the best player that you can be, you know, who you're playing against, what the team's record is, what the score in the game is, none of those things should really matter. I tell players all the time, when I was in the NFL, they made me a cut-up of you. I didn't know who you were playing against. I didn't know what the score of the game was. But I was evaluating how you played every play in that game. So if it's your goal to be the best player you can be, so maybe you have an opportunity to develop a career as a football player, why would you let any of these external factors impact and affect how you play, how you focus, how you keep mental intensity and energy up to be the best that you can be? I don't I don't. So that's, that's one of the ways that I do it. Um, it's the most common way to do it. Yeah, hey, always talking about people's money or future money is a good way, you know, to kind of get to the bottom, especially if that is potentially a goal or a dream to change an entire generation for your family. Uh, you know, coaches sometimes change, though, too, coach. You know, like they always talk about prevent defense or not being as aggressive whenever you get the lead. Is that something that you talk to your coordinators about? Is that something that's just understood, or how do you handle that situation? No, oh, absolutely. You know, you want to stay aggressive in the game. And, and until the circumstances in the game change, like it's four minutes at the end of the game, like we did a good job of that, keeping the ball for five minutes at the end of the game and not giving it back to Arkansas, that's, that situation changes kind of what you do and how you go about what you're doing. 
But the rest of the game, you want to stay aggressive and um, let the players play uh, and do what you prepare them to do. And, um, you know, I, I always use the analogy with players like, what if? Okay, what if you played to be the best player that you could be? What if you supported your teammates all the time? What if you were a good leader and you affected somebody else by the example that you saw set? You know, all those things are things that you can control on a day-to-day -day basis. After the fact, you always say, if only I would have done this. If only I'd have prepared better. If only I would have supported my teammates better. Well, you can't do anything about that. Then you can do everything about what's happening now. You know, I used to talk to guys about the church or what's happening now, man. You, you, you got you to gotta affect the moment, all right, in terms of what you're doing every day in preparation and every opportunity that you get so that you have a chance to be the best player you can be. Did you say the church or what's happening now? Church of what's happening now. Yeah. Hey, Amen. I, I, I like that church. Yeah, I, I like that church a lot. I'm trying to live in the moment. My brain isn't big enough to live anywhere else, but I am certainly a servant. No, a uh, yeah, yeah, a them. servant of yeah. the church of what's happening now, mm -hmm. and I will be forever. Let's talk about the game this weekend before the boys have a couple questions for you, Coach. Uh, obviously, last year, Tennessee, Alabama, third Saturday in October, ended with uh, goalposts getting taken down to a river that I jumped in hours before that. This year, a little bit different team. The Tennessee team looks vastly different than they did last year. Your team looks vastly different than it did last year. What's the message you're telling the boys about this Tennessee game, and what do you see from this Tennessee team versus last, uh, last year's team? Well, I think the big thing for our guys is, you know, we have played well when, you know, we're a little bit uh, upset and have an edge to us. And that's something that we have to go in this game with. I thought we played the game last year with a lot of anxiety. Uh, there was a lot on the line. A lot of guys put a lot of pressure on themselves. We, 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 we don't really want to go there. You know, we want to keep an edge about how we compete, how we focus, how we play. Because the way they play challenges you to do that. You know, when they go fast on offense, they run 2.7 plays a minute. All right, that's completely different for a defensive player. It's a difficult preparation because you can't get the scout team to do it right, you know, during the week of practice. And they're going to go fast. And you have to be able to get lined up on defense and not make mental mistakes and be able to execute and do what you do. You also can't substitute in the game, all right, because they're not going to allow you to substitute on third down. So a third down package is something else that you, 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 you have to be able to execute with the people in the game. Their defense is very aggressive. they got good pass rushers, and we're going to have to do a good job of controlling the ball, try to keep it away from them some, all right, so they don't run 100 plays in a game. And um, – you know, it's going to come down to fundamental execution on offense, which has been our little bit of a Achilles heel in terms of our consistency is playing with good fundamental execution. I don't care if it's offensive line, receivers, pass protection, quarterback execution, whatever you want to talk about. It's good at times, but we have to be consistent. You know, success is defined by consistency and performance. You do that by having great knowledge. Right? And to get the knowledge, you've got to go through bumps in the road. So you've got to learn from your mistakes. You can't waste a failing and, and keep moving in the right direction, which I think a lot of our players have done that well this year. And with that knowledge and experience, then you communicate better. And that communication helps everybody on your unit play better. Because a lot of times when we have mental errors and mistakes, it comes from lack of communication, which can come from lack of conf confidence, which can come from lack of knowledge. All right, so all those things become really, really important in games like this so you can stay focused. Coach, every time you get rolling right there, I feel like I become a better human. You need to know that. Yeah, I feel like I become a, a better human with the way – well, the reason why you have a lack of confidence, though, is probably because you have a lack of knowledge, which is probably a cause of a lack of work, which means we can really break this entire thing down from a small point of what are you doing – right now in this church that we're living in. Amen. Coach, I wish I could. I know I'm on scholarship now, but I wish I could have got a chance to play for you. I, I don't know what I would do if I had these types of messages every single day. Is the equipment manager charged with spotting the ball? And how many times has he been, uh, you know, chewed out or potentially questioned this week as you get ready for the fast team? 
He's been chewed out a few times. Yeah. <laughs> uh, if we could get the ball set, I believe that has probably been said a few times. Tone has a question for you, Coach. Coach, a lot has been made this week in the NFL that scoring is down the lowest in like 10 years. Um, I saw that college football scoring is also down. Is there any reason that you think that may be? Is it, is it just that defenses are, are catching up to the spread and potentially the tempo? Uh, is it the new timing rules? Is there a reason that you think college football scoring might be done? It's, you know, that's surprising to me. I wasn't really aware of that. Um, haven't really thought about it. Um, I know that scoring has been going up probably for the last 10 years, Yeah. probably because of tempo, probably because of some of the rules in college football that created RPOs, blocking behind the line of scrimmage if the ball's thrown behind the line of scrimmage. Those are huge advantages for offense and creates a lot of run-pass conflicts for defensive players. But um, I do think that people on defense are doing different things to try to um, sort of equal the playing field. And I think one of the things that you know, the Ravens started doing maybe five years ago is a lot of simulated pressures. And um, you know this gives offense – a problem because somebody's rushing that's not supposed to be rushing and somebody's dropping who's supposed to be rushing. So that kind of messes them up a little bit on some of these things that they're, they're, they're trying to do offensively. And, um, we do that a little bit, but it gets a little harder to do it when, um, you don't have the right personnel on the field. Okay. Have college defenses got more sophisticated over time here the last like 10 years? Do you think? I think so. I absolutely think so. I think that, you know, when, People started going no huddle. Defenses got simpler. Uh, and I think now because we've all adapted to that, like we don't even we, we don't even have like the first page of the notebook used to be. This is how we get in the huddle. We, we don't even have that page anymore. <laughs> goes and stands where they line up and gets a signal from the sidelines and goes and tries to execute. So. In games like this, every player on the defense has to know the signal. We, we don't have time to communicate it across the board or even have a signal caller to tell everybody what the call is. So uh, I think we've gotten, and, and in doing that, we've been able to do more things that way, like one-word calls. Like I used to think if you called a defense, like when I was a defensive coordinator at the Cleveland Browns, say, you know, I thought if I called um, base closed, triple 88, six Bronco. That was telling everybody what to do on every formation. If you try to make that call now against a fastball team, no way. Before Bronco even gets out, that ball is snapped. We just have a one-word call for that. Buckeye. Okay? Buckeye. All right, so, and I'm saying, well, the players will never remember all that. Well, they actually do it better that way than the other way. Because the other way, they were thinking about 15 different things. This way, they're thinking about one thing and just applying it to whatever it is they see. When that happened? So, when that happened, Coach? Uh, when Ole Miss beat us two out of three years going fast. <laughs> <laughs> I can't take it anymore. What do we need to do? Oh, I love it. Go ahead, AJ. Coach, on the flip side, for for an offense, you hear coaches or people talk about on TV that you have to have a balanced attack, like between your run and pass game. Is that? Does that have uh, as much weight as people, I think, give it? Do you have to have a balanced attack, or isn't the offense just kind of taking what the defense will give them? Well, I, I think that ideally you would like to have a balanced attack because the whole philosophy behind that is the run game is going to help the pass game, the pass game is going to help the run game. So if you have that balance, that's going to be a good thing. But I do agree with you that you really do have to take what the defense gives you. And you don't want to run negative plays into bad looks. So the more you can eliminate that through having the right call, whether it's run to pass or run to run, uh, that that obviously helps, you know, a lot. So, um, but I also think on offense, you have to feature the players you have. On defense, you have to play a system because it has to adapt to a lot of things, a lot of different offensive things that you're going to see. But on offense, you have to, do what the players you have can do and feature the talent that you have. And if that requires passing the ball a lot because that's the kind of team you have, then to me that's what you should do. Uh, if you have a big old offensive line and people are going to play nickel defense all the time and they're small and you can run it, then 
that's that's what your team can do. That's what you should do. So on offense, you have to feature the talent that you have. The thought of you looking at Derrick Henry before every single game and then looking at the other team and just going, yeah, we're going to run the ball. We should. We should. <laughs> I mean, they can't tackle the guy. That's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's talk about your quarterback. We do this every single week, and I think I have enjoyed kind of the flow of the season mm-hmm. for Mr. Milrow because of, you know, how he performed. Then the benching happens against USF. Then he comes back. You see great leadership out of him. You see great confidence out of him. The conversation about him was like, okay, this is old-school Alabama football, just like it was when Trent Richardson was there, just like when Derrick Henry was there. They're going to be pounding the rock. Now this dude's throwing for 300 yards. He's opening up the pass thing. The deep ball is like one of the most explosive plays you guys have, and it happens in abundance. What have you learned from him, and how much more growth does he have this season, you think, as the Alabama quarterback? No, I, I think Jalen has done an outstanding job of um, communicating, uh, showing leadership, you know, with his teammates. Uh, I think his teammates have grown confident in him, I, which I think is important. It would be important to all of us if we're playing on a team that everybody believes in you, trust in you, you have great relationships with the people that you're playing. I think, you know, that creates a lot of positive Things. And I think that has developed for us offensively. I think it's developed with the passing game. Uh, we still have things to clean up. We could still be a little more consistent in the passing game, but we have made a lot of explosive plays. And I think that's something that we want to continue to be able to do. But to you know AJ's point before, when you run the ball effectively, those explosive plays sometimes are out there for you to get because of the way they're playing you on defense. Yeah, it feels like everybody's kind of hesitant because they're scared to death that Milrow is going to do his thing, and then all of a sudden that leaves a lot of time for your weapon. You got speed. Hey, we got speed. Not as many big names at wide receiver, but we got some speed that's been able to be exposed some defenses. That's good. Hey, coach, they counted you out, didn't mm-hmm. they? Hey, they counted yeah. Alabama out yeah. just a few weeks ago. Now we're growing. That capability gap is getting smaller mm-hmm. uh-huh. and smaller and small favored by eight and a half this weekend. You don't win by that. Everybody thinks you're a loser. Ty has a question for you, Coach. <laughs> yeah, Coach. Post game, uh, you you made a comment. It was it was something to the effect of like we need to learn how to to beat teams and not just win games. But I'm just curious. Like, do you take any solace or comfort in the fact that your team does know how to win close games? Because I feel like that is a trait that all great teams possess. Yeah, I think that's true. I think our team is showing great resiliency and being able to win games. And I think that's really, really important. And I wouldn't trade that for anything. But there is a difference between beating the other team and winning the game. Because if you beat the other team, it means you're able to impose your will on the individual that you played against and you did it collectively as a team, which in essence is what you would love to have happen to see your team play the way they're capable of playing. So um, that's something that, you know, we want to continue to try to instill, you know, in our players that um, we want to impose our will on the opposition, regardless of what the score is. Don't have to be behind to do it. We still do it when we're ahead. Because, you you know, I mean, I think the Colorado game was a great example of, you know, a little bit what happened to us last week. Get ahead 29 nothing in the game. You know, guys lose their mental intensity, their focus, and then the game starts to change and the momentum swings and you can't get it back. All right. So you have to learn how to sustain and grind through it and continue to impose your will so you never lose that. The other team's going to make plays. You got to play the next play and everybody's got to learn how to do that. But, um, I like the fact that our team has resiliency and they've been able to learn, to, to win close games. Do you talk to Coach Prime during this season at all or not really? I have not, but he is a great friend and I root for him all the time. His speech he gave after oh. the game was just like, that was the first time, you know, because he is a, you know, he's a hard-ass coach. I don't think people really understand that about accountability and everything. And he just kind of was fed up with them and say, hey, we're practicing tomorrow. We're getting back in there. Not that you have that on the horizon with this Alabama team, but how do you get that bad taste out of a team's mouth? Like, what is the immediate next day's messaging and how do you move on from something as devastating as that? I think that's one thing great about being in competitive sports. You always have a next opportunity. And as long as you can look forward 
and take advantage of the opportunities that you have in the future and not dwell on the past. Like, you know, you've heard me say this before, but we have a 24 hour rule around here. All right. We win 24 hours. It's over. We got to get ready for the next game. We lose 24 hours. It's over. We got to get ready for the next game. So um, I think, though, that it's actually more difficult in this day and age for players to deal with success and than it is failure. You know, most of the time when you have failure, people respond really, really well. Uh, but sometimes when you're successful, it can be an enemy of how you stay focused and what you do to prepare. Uh, and you become, using that same term, relieved. All right, we won the game. I should be able to take it easy. I sold my 10 car quota. I should get my trip to the Bahamas. I mean, that's how people think. You can't think like that, that in competitive sports. I heard you got a great car dealership down there, too. I heard you're in the car game a little bit. I, I fancy myself a car person as well. Not the cars you have, though. <laughs> no. Hey, not the cars you have. I heard we have a couple Ferraris rolling around down there. Is that right? This one. We had two, but we <laughs> traded two to the one that we wanted, which is the way it works with Ferrari. <laughs> hey, listen, listen to this. Just a West Virginia boy rolling around in a Ferrari being called the GOAT. You're the man. We appreciate the hell out of you joining us. I appreciate it, man. But I want everybody to know I started in a pickup truck, an orange one, and uh, used to go scrape the ball diamond with my dad. And, you know, a lot of the things that I learned about accountability came from that pickup truck. I'm sure you're taking care of that Ferrari now because of that pickup truck. We appreciate the <laughs> hell out of you. Ladies and gentlemen, Coach Saban, thank yeah. you, buddy. Oh.